Um, I wanted to start off uh, from the story that Colin shared with all of us, the certain general story, uh, Dr. Reginald, right? Yeah. Um, and that particular uh, uh, idea that um, I was thinking about how a culture-centered approach could be used to understand that situation. And uh, as I was trying to break through it, I was thinking, okay, um, well, if I were using a culture-centered method or a culture-centered approach, I would probably, my, my, my inclination probably would be to ask, to listen, to hear what that person had to say or that that patient had to say about um, her or her wanting the medicine or not wanting the medicine or whatever. And then taken the story from there and taken whatever we needed to like, like move on from there. And as I was thinking, I was saying, well, then there is a method in this madness, right? There is, there is some way we are doing it, thinking about it, analyzing it, writing about it, putting it in practice. And uh, this sort of, uh, 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 this is what uh, uh, we are trying to talk about, Mohan and I are trying to talk about in this paper. And uh, we're talking about trying to formalize a culture-centered method. Um, a lot of this uh, impetus for this paper comes from the classroom. Um, whenever I teach qualitative methods, I taught it last semester, um, there is a point where we come to talk about the culture-centered approach to health communication, or the culture-centered approach to communication. And then the question comes, so what are the methods involved in this particular conceptual idea? And uh, the answer has been, for the most part, even as I struggle with it, uh, it, is that it can encompass a lot of methods. And we have done a lot of ways of culture-centered work. What we thought we would try and do is try and bring all that together and see if we can, maybe for the first time, attempt to formalize something of a method, some steps that could act as guidelines um, say that I could offer to my students who want to do culture a culture-centered method. So what, what I'm going to present here is an attempt towards that. It's an open question, it's an open book, and uh, what I'm hoping is that we will be able to take um, feedback from all of you and use it to move uh, this on. Care, a culture-centered method in communication. The idea that communication should necessarily ascribe to a culture-centered logic in the face of increasing worldwide inequities is not new, particularly when we are dealing with interventions aimed at structural and social change in the global south. In our work on and with this culture-centered logic in communication for more than 12 years now, we have witnessed scholarship and participatory projects being mapped out on issues ranging from poverty to public relations, from narratives of farmer suicides to those on HIV and health among subaltern sex workers, from organizing resistance to deconstructing global media policy texts, and from performances in marginalized spaces to, spaces to photo testimonies on violence and inaccess. What is clear in these many projects and more is the vital connection between the culture-centered approach, CCA, and post-colonial studies of post-colonial theory. The prerogative of the CCA, as I understand, we understand it, is to privilege the narratives that emerge in conversations with people at the margins, to be able to listen in a way that matters to people in the dominant discourse. Uh, drawing from post-colonial theories, this approach challenges the colonial logic of knowledge creation and management, whereby knowledge, culture, history is created in the neoliberal network and is then disseminated to colonies across the globe. Our aim in this paper, or this presentation, is to interrogate the process of this culture-centered approach to communication, the process. Drawing from variously articulated conceptualizations of what can constitute a culture-centered method, concepts such as solidarity, reflexivity, co-construction, critical ethnography, testimonial, etc., we, we begin to formulate the idea of care, C-A-R-E, care, which is synonymous with care 
as a method to guide culture-centered communication practice. We expect, and this is just an expectation, to engage with certain ideas or philosophies in Buddhism, such as compassion and imagination, as we scope out this concept of care. So, in this presentation that follows, um, we attempt to formalize for the first time what a culture-centered method to communication might entail, and how such a method might provide social change activists and scholars a set of flexible guidelines to conduct culture-centered research in communication. We will begin with a brief argument on methodology before contextualizing the CCA within its methodological commitment, which is post-colonial studies. Um, then we lay out a description of care as a culture-centered method, and then attempt to present the steps that care could include. The last part, which we are still thinking through, is we hope to provide an example of doing care as a culture-centered method. Um, we will conclude by connecting literature with promises of the future. Those are projects uh, that will follow. So talking about knowledge and methodology. Uh, methodological paradigms are more than what um, we actually know. They are, uh, uh, they are more than ways of studying reality. They are a part of a research enterprise which Anderson Long will call a public industry whose product is uh, justified knowledge claims. So we are in an industry, it's a, it's a knowledge industry, where we fight for space to product uh, to, to market a product, uh, which is knowledge. So argued within the archaeology of knowledge and its interlope with power, it is not hard to fathom why methodology, which by which I mean the philosophy of the method, is a site of struggle for power over what constitutes an authentic system to script and propagate social reality. Even though scholarship tries to situate itself on a moral high ground, the politics of staying in power of having the right to enumerate the right and the wrong is as much an intrinsic part of it as it is for any other set of human practices. Um, the, the American Heritage Dictionary <laughs> uh, describes methodology as a body of practices and rules within use within a discipline. In, in other words, a set of working methods central to a particular schema of constructing, recognizing, and perpetuating the knowledge. Different paradigms of knowledge are thus traditionally situated in corresponding methods of knowing and engaging with that particular knowledge claim. So methodology offers a method, proffers a method of creating a particular brand of knowledge, guiding research invested in this particular brand of knowledge creation. So, Methodology then becomes a, discourse, discons, uh, a discursive construction of philosophy that helps to de delineate an admissible, correct way of doing a particular brand of research. So it's a philosophy of a method, as I've been saying. Uh, what's, the, what's the philosophy of the culture-centered approach then? What's a culture-centered method, me methodology? Um, the CCA and, any, and consequently any culture-centered method draws inspiration from post-colonial theory broadly, and subordinate studies in particular. When it was initially for formalized by uh, Mohan in 2008, uh, in his first book on culture and health, where he speaks in detail about uh, the culture-centered method, the CCA was more of an approach to health communication. It was set up in response to and as a paradigmatic shift from this dominant ideology that informed and still informs most health campaigns. It underlines the understanding that communication about health is essentially a process of negotiation of shared meanings situated in interdependent notions of cultures, identities, social norms, and structures. That also draws a lot from Collins's work. Drawing from post-colonial theories and subaltern studies, this approach challenges the colonial logic of knowledge creation and management. So if post-colonialism uh, well, post post refers to the social, political, economic, and cultural practices which arise in response to an in a resistance to colonialism, where colonialism or the colonial project can be explained as a normalizing rule of colonial difference, namely the preservation of alienness, of the, of the ruling group, or the paradigm representing the other as inferior and radically different, and hence incorrigibly inferior. Part of Chatterjee, 1993. 
Post-colonial studies, according to uh, Dr. Shom and uh, her co-author Dr. Henry, is concerned uh, not merely with chronicling the facts in the history of colonialism. Its commitment and goals are critical, insurgent, and biological insofar as it theorizes not just the colonial conditions, but why those conditions are what they are and how they can be undone and redone. Um, so they argue, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shom and Dr. Hegre, the questions and problematics of colonialism that post-colonial scholarship concerns itself with emerge from larger social contexts, contemporary or past, of modernity. In engaging with questions of colonialism and modernity, post-colonial scholarship often finds itself colliding with the limits of knowledge structures in terms of scope and method, derived from and enabled by various imperial and national modernities within which Anglo-Euro Academy was produced and is ensconced. In the process, it tries to redo such epistemic structures by writing against them, over them, and from below them by inviting reconnections to obliterated pasts and forgotten presents that never made their way into the history of knowledge. It's a, a, a quote from their um, work in 2002 in the uh, communication, published in the communication theory. Now, when we were talking about the culture-centered approach to health communication and connecting that to post-colonial theory again, uh, we were saying that the post-colonial post lens then offered CCA the nodes to contextualize the articulation and advocacy of health discourse within the ambit of historical relationships between European imperialism and the peripheral colonies in the project of modernity. Okay. In that project then, the positions of the expert and the subject are challenged and localized health knowledge is foregrounded and pitted against the impetus of the colonial impetus of the expert driven health knowledge that seeks to maintain the position of the expert by universalizing the knowledge it creates uh, it creates for those at the margins this is something that we've been talking about since yesterday i think in the different forms today as well however well the cca over the last few years has slowly been contextualized over a range of topics in communication we've seen work in health in organizations as i said public relations media advocacy campaigns performance studies to name a few in all of these imaginaries it continues to be informed by a subaltern studies post-colonial critique the subaltern studies project articulates the erasures and absences of narratives belonging to certain groups of people from what we determine as history or the discourse about who we are and what we should aspire to be about desired power relations and equations of labor and profit. Um, John Beverly in 2004 spoke about subordinity as a condition of subord subordination brought about by colonization. Uh, the, the Subaltern Studies project uh, started around the 1980s by uh, Ronaldir Kuba and his uh, 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 group of colleagues uh, was in response to what they described as the disillusionment of hope at the failure of the Indian nation state to fulfill its promise of nationhood even, even uh, two decades after the British uh, Britain's retreat. So we are talking about the idea of who has power, the power to be heard in a way that matters to the, uh, to, to, to the discursive paradigm that matters. Okay, it is a project of positioning the subaltern with respect to her or his condition of coloniality, a condition that pushes her and keeps her at the peripheries of modernity. <coughs> From a culture-centered perspective, uh, tenets from the Subaltern Studies project draws attention to the need to foreground the communicative enactment of identity and agency of the subaltern colonial subject. So issues of voice and identity as they play out in subaltern contexts are problematized and taken for granted dominant assumptions about subaltern's uh, lack of ability to speak and act for her or his own good are challenged. This opens up the space, the discursive space, for storing life narratives and meaning-making processes and outcomes of subalterns and their colonized spaces. 
The culture-centered approach thus questions the ideology and the political motive of the dominant paradigm's take on what constitutes knowledge and the methods employed to create it. So we're talking about this knowledge industry again. How do we create it? What are the processes we employ to create knowledge? It unravels the claim that knowledge creation is, val is value-free and points to a prevailing political agenda of, abs of absenting uh, certain stories from the margins of civil society in order to maintain control over the discourses and mechanisms of knowledge creation and propagation. At this point then, uh, we assume it is safe to conclude that the culture-centered approach and any method true to it is a political project that involves partaking in a discourse that goes against the grain, ultimately posing frameworks for writing alternative histories. That's how we can position the culture-centered approach within uh, the bigger discourse of post-colonial studies. So the culture-centered approach to communication seeks to question those new neoliberal knowledge spaces that absent colonize his and her stories, while at the same time struggling to inscribe such stories in those same spaces with the goal of challenging and transforming the dominant narrative. If we theorize communication, this is important here, if we theorize communication to be a process and outcome of meaning making, then storying, narrating, and historying can be considered intrinsic to the communication phenomenon. The CCA in this sense transposes historical and literary theoretical understandings, post-colonial theory, into what we call the social scientific lineage of communication studies one that is about the messages and the messaging, and about generalizing and predicting human communication behavior. To conclude the assumption we made at the beginning of this paragraph, we can say that the C CCA messes the canvas of existing mainstream research on human communication behavior. At this juncture, and given our understanding that a mainstay of social scientific communication research has been its stress on method-related vigor, uh, rigor, and vigor, we, we feel compelled to at least make an attempt to sketch out the rudimentary rubrics of what a culture-centered method could be. But before we do that, just a, a, a small, a short paragraph uh, about the, oh, so, so I've spoken about this, about the, the, the various uh, uh, projects that we have undertaken under the CCA that sort of uh, span different areas of communication. Um, and in many of these projects, we have thought through and we have written about concepts such as dialogue, uh, sub solidarity, reflexivity, co construction of narratives, participatory communication, critical ethnography, analysis of texts and campaigns through, culture, through the culture structure agency lens that makes of the CCA, listening that matters, autoethnography, poetry, photo voice, thematic analysis. So these are all the, the processes we have written about when, when it comes to uh, talking about a culture-centered method, all of these uh, in different forms. What we are yet to formalize among our band of culture-centered communication scholars is a method of culture-centered research practice that could bring together and possibly reorganize these aforementioned concepts into a set of tentative steps, a culture-centered method of communication research. The onerous task here involves importing of the post-colonial theoretical perspective into the practice domain of research. Okay. During such a task, one is often left with little specific direction regarding how to conduct research. So, what I'm going to offer here is an idea of, finally, an idea of the culture-centered method. And what, it, what, what entails the idea of care as a culture-centered method? Culture-centered method, a post-colonial interrogation. Schoem and Hegre, again in 2002, in their seminal piece on postcolonial theory and communication studies, note that one issue to which postcolonial scholars should remain committed is one of methodological reflexivity. Okay. Further, they add that regardless of the orientation of one's research, a postcolonial theoretical leaning necessitates acute awareness about the legacies of the methods and the dilemma that consequence 
that consequently confronts the researcher as a consequence of his or her research orientation method being situated within the larger cartographies of colonialism. Okay. They are pointing to the idea of reflexivity. That's how we tend to make sense of it. Of essence in the culture-centered method is a warrant to infuse narratives co-created by the reflexively oriented researcher and the research participant into the dominant cultural narrative fabric such that voices of the subordinate so long erased from the discourses that matters, discourses that matter, finds its rightful respect and meaning. This ideal centralizes a reflexive process of inquiry that seeks, that seeks to preserve and analyze situated form, content, and experience of social action. The researcher is spatially and discursively situated at the point of meaning making and brings to bear her or his values, ideals, goals, and beliefs into the meaning-making process as she or he interacts with those of her or his collaborators in subaltern spaces. Reflexivity in this post-colonial sense, okay, important, in this particular post-colonial sense, amounts to responsibility and accountability. In other words, we centered the politics of positionality in the methods we adopt. We turn back on ourselves and make ourselves accountable for our chosen research paradigms, our position of authority and our responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the judgments and interpretations of locally created narratives, locally co-created narratives. So as I think we were talking the, uh, uh, yesterday, the goal is for the interlocutor or us to move away from the picture We'll come to that later. Uh, through this process, we not only critique the notion of objectivity in research, but also the notion of subjectivity that is shorn of the resistive political ideology of self-reflection. We are not talking about subjectivity. We are talking about critical subjectivity. Critical to this stance is the effort to weave in the ethics of accountability and taking a chance to be proved wrong by making the method accessible, transparent, and vulnerable to evaluation. Thus, we are critically aware of and reflexive about the dangers of the research processes we adapt, adopt, and we question the very foundations of our method of engaging with subaltern voices. This me uh, method is aligned with the works of Concord and uh, Soini Madison, who explored the role of ethnography as a political tool for challenging the status quo and for listening to the voices of the marginalized. To quote Madison, we intend to use the resources, skills, and privileges available to make accessible, to penetrate the borders and break through the confines in defense of the voices and experiences of subjects whose stories are re restrained and out of reach. This means the critical ethnographer contributes to emancipatory knowledge and, uh, and discourse of social justice. It is this responsibility of being reflexive, the way we have described it above, that ought to guide a culture-centered method in communication research. And this type of responsibility comes from, from and results in what Paulo Freire says he will die struggling against a lack of hope. So to quote Paulo Freire, this is one of my biggest fears, that humanity falls into this kind of postmodern fatalism. Freire's, Paulo Freire states, as he explains why one of his critical ideologies is hoping for and dreaming of altering existing relationalities across the globe. This is a recent book. It's a collection of Paulo Freire's. Uh, it's a collection of essays and lectures that recently came out in 2014. In a particular uh, 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 portion in this book, he states, I always say that I personally did not come to the world in order to adapt myself to the world. I came to change. Maybe I won't change it, but at least I need to know that I could change it and that I must try. 
we can extrapolate this conceptualization in the context of post-colonial studies and culture-centered research and call this a compelling inclination towards and commitment to hope and transformation of our unequal world. We could call it compassion for social justice or we could call it solidarity and a call for action. Inherent in the culture-centered method is a commitment to resistance and struggle, that of resisting dominant objective empiricist ways of engaging with subalterns first and second, that of positioning one's political self at the center of meaning-making and engaging in research that questions the very fundamentals of doing it. Implied here is a struggle to work against the grain of one's own interests and prejudices by unlearning privilege and by contesting the authority of the academy and knowledge centers at the same time that we continue to participate in them and deploy that authority. This is a quote from Beverly, John Beverly's work in 2004. This struggle has a political agenda, that of staking one's agenda and privileges in the struggle and collaborating in the process of writing in reverse. Embedded in this struggle, a culture-centered method asks the researcher to strive to partake in the creation and sustenance of platforms that listen to subaltern cultural articulations and thus make voices important to mainstream knowledge structures. And though this endeavor is located within contradictory and often contested political spheres related to the impossibility of re representing the subaltern, it underscores what Beverly again describes as the methodology of solidarity that calls for action through scripting against the grain. The subaltern script constitutes an insurgent script. It entails writing in reverse because it is an attempt to recover or represent the subaltern as a subject of history from the welter of democracy and historiographic discourses that deny the subaltern the power of agency. Again, this is a quote from Beverly. By documenting and foregrounding subaltern discourse, which exists despite and along with attempts in the dominant discourse to, de to delegitimize it, and that is what I would like or we would like to term as alternative rationalities or realities, one attempts to configure, reconfigure those processes of scripting knowledge that privilege the expert's voice at the expense of the margins. Now, this new form of academic knowledge production by intervening Politically, the production on the side of the subaltern, solidarity comes in here, reverses the direction of knowledge writing and hence propagates a mechanism of writing in reverse. The momentum shifts from a desire of objectivity, desire for objectivity, to the desire for solidarity, whereby methods of engaging with subaltern texts go beyond romanticizing the subaltern or assuming that conversation can indeed happen with the subaltern without acknowledging power divides that we said extend mainstream, ma mainstream margin relations. In dictionary terms, compassion is defined as consciousness of others' distress coupled with a desire to lessen it. And solidarity, in the sense we've explained so far, is compassion for the marginalized subalterns, subaltern in a way that advocates a commitment to social justice and the more just distribution of material and discursive resources in our world. Compassion in the culture-centered method finds validation through conversation with the subaltern, but in a format that accounts for the power divide and seeks to alter it in a way that allows the subaltern to enter into the journey. By being prepared to listen to subalterns talking back and resisting the content and frames that constitute the conversation, Used synonymously with solidarity, it materializes through a readiness to formalize and foreground that dialogue with a subordinate participant, which disrupts our high-minded discourse of ethical benevolence and epistem epistemological privilege, especially at moments when the discourse claims to speak for the other. In other words, a culture-centered method that constitutes compassion or solidarity and or solidarity invokes those methods of engaging with subalterns that call for a readiness to participate in a struggle to locate subaltern sense-making as authentic and worth listening to, not so much as an attempt to speak for or represent these articulations objectively, but being complicit with one's biases and prejudices, but being com complicit in creating, interpreting, and documenting them. The methodology of solidarity creates a space for subalternity to not only signify its condition of marginality, but also to communicate and enact its potential to transform structures and cultural conditions of marginality. 
Let us start to tie the threads together now. A culture-centered method of communication espouses foundationally compassion, action, and reflexivity responsibility. Let us call this care. C for compassion, A for action, and refle R, E, the reflexivity parts of care. Let us call this the care method in culture-centered communication. Um, very agno well, agnostic Buddhist writings, such as that of Stephen Batchelor, which I read a lot, describe compassion as an imaginary by which one is able to shake oneself out of the grip of self-centeredness. It is also explained as the moment of the non-self that leads to reflection and probing of one's normal self-absorbing ways. And dharma practice dictates that cultivation of compassion should not be left to chance. It should become a method of caring with and for the others beyond me and mine. Dharma practice here refers to the way of life undertaken by someone who is inspired by the teachings of the Buddha and to those aspects of reality with which his teachings are concerned. This inclination to a care-centered dharma practice thus calls for an imaginary of continued commitment to recreate our world, to transform it, not transcend it. It calls for a new social ordering. A care method in culture-centered communication, likewise, demands an allegiance to an imagination of a creative culture of social action geared towards redoing inequities in resources and absences and histories of those at the margins. In the final section of the paper that follows, which we, which we'll take, which we don't have right now, we'll attempt to offer broad guidelines for conducting culture-centered care. We don't have this last part. That, that part depends on what we hear from all of you, but we've started working on it. So we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of how we would want to end this essay with what we call the guidelines for care. As I said, tentative workable guidelines to conduct a, a culture-centered method, to use a culture-centered method. Guidelines with care. Let us begin with the question of choosing a method, qualitative, quantitative, mixed, any of these, or any combination of these. What method we choose will certainly depend on the focus of our research and our research goals and the research question. Here we need to keep in mind that the discerning feature of culture-centered method with care, or let's talk, let's uh, uh, term it the culture-centered method with care, is its open commitment to critiquing the stat status quo and building a more just society. Hence, research projects focused on communicating about communication processes or meaning-making processes and outcomes in marginalized contexts would probably be better served with care. For instance, a research that proposes to understand how business persons in, for example, Samoa and Iceland communicate would likely not be situated uh, uh, suited well to the care. A research study that aims to understand how indigenous communities in Samoa communicate about their identity in the backdrop of a dominant national identity in the Samoan Islands could, on the other hand, be a topic of interest for a culture-centered project with care. Note that the research verb, as we would like to call it, is understand, right? The word understand in both projects mentioned. However, the culture-centered method with care might not want to determine if a qualitative, quantitative, or a mixture of methods should be used in the projects. The care points to a particular angle of inquiry that may well use multiple methods and techniques. It is unlikely, however, that given the historical impetus of using numbers to chiefly conduct research to find facts, objective truths, a solo quantitative research projects would align with CARE's political bent towards enacting emancipatory social change. So that's sort of a caveat. The CARE project might probably sit better with mixed methods strategy. For example, while qualitative data bring to light the, uh, could bring to light the complex interplay, interplay between poverty and racialization, numerical data might reveal the extent of relationship between these variables. What is important about a postcolonial perspective, then, is that there are no prescribed techniques for data collection or data analysis. 
Different techniques can be drawn on depending on the focus of the inquiry as long as they meet the criteria for, if I am allowed to say, adequacy and rigor, or as Mohan spoke about yesterday, authenticity. This discussion on the process, strategy, and research question will, however, be ultimately dictated by CARE's political commitment to solidarity and reflexivity responsibility. Hence, it is necessary to ask if the research project is set up to allow solidarity with the marginalized narrative and the scope to be accountable for the baggage that the researcher brings to the project. The research study that aims to understand how indigenous communities in Samoa communicate about their identity in the backdrop of a dominant national identity in the Samoan Islands might fit the bill in this case. This project offers us a chance to understand and document how race, class, history, geography intersect at any given moment to organize experiences in the here and the now, which is a critical post-colonial focus. It is important to note, and I'm, uh, I'm, uh, towards the end of it, is it, it is important to note that we are take, talking in probabilities here, choosing uh, uh, to use words such as might, could, possibly, likely, etc. One good rationale for such a move within the culture-centered method is the acknowledgement that any research project is ultimately an interpretive act, and talking in possibilities or uh, probabilities probably, talking in probabilities probably lays out a platform and encouragement for continued debate on issues related to cultures in the communication research with care. And this ties back to Dr. Shoman Hegre's brilliant warning with methodological reflexivity, suffusing post-colonial interrogation. So this is the first part of us talking about, just thinking about the research question. Then we follow up with different parts of how we conduct research, we would like to call it that way, um, in terms of data organizing and then writing. And how does care, the method of care, sort of inform all of these steps? Ultimately, our goal at the end of the paper is to be able to provide three or four general guidelines that say, when you are doing a product, a, a project, a research project with care, these are guidelines that you might keep in mind. And I think this will be very, very handy for me, for anyone else, as, as I said, as I uh, teach my students qualitative methods, and they ask me, so how am I supposed to do a culture center approach? Thank you.